How do you dress so well? Any tips? Well, you know, thank you. Um, I started buying nice clothes, let's say, this year, really. I had some decent suits before that. Um, I did some research online to find out who good suit manufacturers were. You can look that up. But in, before this tour, I went and talked to a good tailor, uh, expensive place. I, I felt terrible spending so much money on clothing. Um, but I felt that if I was going to go talk to, it's been 200,000 people, that I was going to do it right and, and I was going to invest in some decent clothes. And even though it, it hurt my um, cheap northern Alberta soul to do it, um, it was definitely worth it. So you go talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Go talk to an actual tailor. And, and, and you can do some research online. There's lots of resources online that are devoted towards devoted to helping men figure out how to dress three-piece suits look really good um i i've got them tailored and fitted so they're not bespoke suits they're off the rack but they've been tailored and that makes a big difference uh, all the subtle things that tailors do they tuck it in around the waist they c cut it to your body all of those things help it's really good to have a good pair of shoes couple of nice ties. I learned how to tie a full Windsor knot recently and that actually helps. Uh, you don't want your tie to look too skinny. Um, lots of people have been dressing up to come to my talk so it's nice to see a lot of young men come well dressed often in three-piece suits but not always and it's really good to see them dressed like grown-ups. I think that's a real plus. Um, I had a rule that I didn't write in 12 rules which was dress like the person you want to be. That's I kind of took that from Carl from from Nietzsche because Nietzsche said um, every great man is an actor of his own ideal. It's a very nice aphorism, and basically what it meant was that sometimes you have to act out what you want to be before you become it. You have to pretend. And it's not a lie. It's it's really a pretense. Like children pretend to be a father before they grow up and become a father. It's a form of practice. And so, tip one might be figure out who you want to be. Tip two might be, well, then dress like that person. That's a good start. And because I think if you want to become who you want to be, then no detail is too small to overlook. And certainly it isn't exactly that people judge you by their clothes, by your clothes, although they do to some degree. It's that if whatever you can have going for you, you might as well have going for you. That's how it looks to me. And certainly my experience has been that the response to my improved wardrobe has indicated that the investment was clearly worth it, um, indisputably and clearly worth it. And it's nice to be dressed sharply to go in front of an audience. It's a sign of respect to the audience. There's other ways of showing respect to an audience, but that's certainly one. And so it's been extraordinarily worthwhile. I would say if you're going for a job interview, if you're at any critical point in your life, then you should dress the part because you want to do everything you can to tip the scales in not in your favor exactly but in favor of having on tour in 2018 before i went out i thought i wanted to do this like 100 percent right or at least as close to that as i could manage so i went out and bought some expensive suits and i spent way more money than i ever thought i'd spend on clothes and i really felt quite bad about it you know i thought maybe it was an extravagance but i thought no way man i'm gonna see if i can nail this dead on and i'm gonna be speaking to you know a hundred thousand people i'm gonna look as sharp as i possibly can and uh one of the consequences of that has been that young men in particular come to the lecture tour dressed up in suits three-piece suits they and the couples come and they're dressed up like they're coming to a wedding or so that's really something and uh, why do you think that is why do you, is, is it because you set that standard sick act and like kids okay you know our whole culture pushes the idea that teenage life or even childhood for that matter but teenage life is some sort of pinnacle and then everybody dresses down so they look especially men they look like overgrown 10 year olds and there's something extremely demeaning about that and so to provide people with the opportunity to dress up in a in a classic manner and to look like adults to present themselves in that manner there's something very attractive about that because we haven't done that in our culture that's been i would say downplayed in importance or 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 for for certainly since the 1960s who's yeah. to blame for that because you recall anytime you would fly in an airplane if you see 
old school pictures. People were dressed in three piece suits to go on an airplane. This is in the '60s, I assume. Yeah. And then now you see someone like Mark Zuckerberg wear a T-shirt to give a speech in front of a TED talk or something like that. So well, who's some to blame of it, for this dress some down? of it's just fashion. You know, I mean, fashion moves around, and then, and it's it usually drifts from the top down. And so when formality becomes the norm, and, but that drifts down, to, say, to the working class, then the upper class thinks, well, we can't do that because that would you know associate us with the unfashionable people and then they dress down and so then that drifts down the hierarchy and so there's some of it, some of it's just fashion but a lot of it too is this idea that th this sort of reflexive rebellious attitude that anything that violates traditional norms or even anything that's associated with patriarchal oppression and adulthood is to be eliminated in favor of what's hypothetically a more free individuality, but it's not because everybody looks the same. I was in Washington four or five years ago, maybe longer than that. It's probably longer than that when I first went in the summer. And one of the things that really struck me, all these people wandering around these great monuments, is all the men looked like overgrown 10-year-olds. They, they looked exactly like their kids, except they were bigger. They looked like they'd been inflated mm. with a bicycle pump. And I thought, this is weird that that adults are dressing like children and not good and so some of its fashion but some of its also that is it exclusive in america how about in canada what have you seen all over the world with this no i don't think it's exclusive to america i think it it was more noticeable to me in washington and i think that's when it really hit me because washington is in some sense a place of pilgrimage and People from every class go there, and, and that's that's a good thing, and, and they should from every economic class. And so it was like a cross, it was a real cross section of the total population, and that was one of the things that struck me quite, quite bluntly. I, I talked to my father about this years ago um, because he always wore a suit when he, he was a teacher. He's still alive, he, he's a teacher, and he always wore a suit. And I asked him why one day, and he said, because it was his way of showing respect for the students. And, I mean, I'm not saying that everyone who doesn't dress in the suit is being disrespectful, but there's something about outfitting yourself for the task at hand. And there's also something about attempting to put some effort into presenting your, putting your best foot forward. And I don't really buy the, it takes more time in the morning argument. It takes a bit more time, but once you, like be, before I went on this tour, I went through all my clothing and I tossed out everything that didn't fit. and which included a number of suits that were old, and I had to organize them, and that took about a day to get my closet in order. I started buying nice clothes, let's say, this year, really. I had some decent suits before that. Um, I did some research online to find out who good suit manufacturers were. You can look that up. But in, before this tour, I went and talked to a good tailor uh, expensive place. I, I felt terrible spending so much money on clothing, um, but I felt that if I was going to go talk to, it's been 200,000 people, that I was going to do it right and, and I was going to invest in some decent clothes and even though it, it hurt my um, cheap northern Alberta soul to do it, um, it was definitely worth it. So you go talk to someone who knows what they're doing. Go talk to an actual tailor and 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 you can do some research online. There's lots of resources online that are devoted towards devoted to helping men figure out how to dress. Three piece suits look really good. Um, I, I've got them tailored and fitted, so they're not bespoke suits. They're off the rack, but they've been tailored. And that makes a big difference. Uh, all the subtle things that tailors do, they tuck it in around the waist, they c cut it to your body, all of those things help. It's really good to have a good pair of shoes, a couple of nice ties. I learned how to tie a full Windsor knot recently and that actually helps. Uh, you don't want your tie to look too skinny. Um, lots of people have been dressing up to come to my talk, so it's nice to see a lot of young men come well-dressed, often in three-piece suits, but not always. And it's really good to see them dressed like grown-ups. I think that's a real plus. Um, I had a rule that I didn't write in 12 rules, which was dress like the person you want to be. That's, I kind of took that from Carl, from, from Nietzsche, because Nietzsche said, um, every great man is an actor of his own ideal. It's a very nice aphorism, and basically what it meant was that 
Sometimes you have to act out what you want to be before you become it. You have to pretend. It's not a lie. It's, it's really a pretense, like children pretend to be a father before they grow up and become a father. It's a form of practice. And so tip one might be figure out who you want to be. Tip two might be, well, then dress like that person. That's a good start. And because I think if you want to become who you want to be, then no detail is too small to overlook. And certainly it isn't exactly that people judge you by their clothes, by your clothes, although they do to some degree. It's that if whatever you can have going for you, you might as well have going for you. That's how it looks to me. And certainly my experience has been that the response to my improved wardrobe has indicated that the investment was clearly worth it, um, indisputably and clearly worth it. And it's nice to be dressed sharply to go in front of an audience. It's a sign of respect to the audience. There's other ways of showing respect to an audience, but that's certainly one. And so it's been extraordinarily worthwhile. I would say if you're going for a job interview, if you're at any critical point in your life, then you should dress the part because you want to do everything you can to tip the scales in not in your favor exactly, but in favor of having the right thing happen. Physical attractiveness is extensively studied in departments of psychology. How big of a determinant of success is it apart from IQ or any of the other big five traits? Um, that's tough one because physical attractiveness is a very complex trait. Um, it's also, for example, it's a marker of health. And of course, health is a mark, is a, prerequisite for success. So we know that physical that people who are physically attractive though are given the benefit of doubt by other people. They they benefit from the positive halo effect and the positive halo effect is the propensity of people to assume good things about someone if there is one outstanding thing about them that's easily evident that's good. And so if you're if you're if you stand up straight with your shoulders back so that's rule one in 12 rules for life then people are going to see you as more attractive if you're symmetrical you're more attractive if you're thin but not too thin you're more attractive um, well and then there's like good skin and good teeth and good hair and and all of those things and proper proportions and youth and there's a whole slew of things that 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 feed into that. If you are characterized by a plethora of those features, then people are also going to assume that you're more competent and more um, and more more worth having around, let's say. But the problem is, is that you are. So separating out the attractiveness from the things the attractiveness are is correlated with is very hard. That's why you have to do multivariate analysis. That's multivariable analysis in any complex social science because a lot of these traits overlap. So, but you know, you can, you can, there's, there's some, some things you can do about that. Postural adjustment is helpful to work out with weights. That's extraordinarily helpful. That, that increases, improves your posture and makes you more confident. And, 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 and you can dress reasonably well and intelligently and um, all of those things to, to help yourself capitalize on whatever attractiveness you can muster. So Zazu, the eyes of the king, comes to check out the king, and that's uh, Mufasa. Yeah, and he's, he's a very regal-looking person, uh, lion, and he stands up straight and tall, and that means that he's high in serotonin because serotonin governs postural flexion, and if so, if you're dominant and near the top of hierarchies, you tend to expand so that you look bigger than, than you could if you shrunk down, and so if you're a low dominant person, you wander around like this so that you look small and weak, and you don't pose a threat to anybody, but if you're at the top, you expand yourself so that you can command the space. And that's why he has that particular kind of regal posture. And if you look at his facial expression, you see that it's quite severe. It, like he's, he's capable of kindness, but he's also harsh and judgmental. And that's what society is like. That's what the superego is like. And what that means is that he's integrated his aggression. And I've seen this happen in my clinical clients. When they come in and they're too agreeable, they look like Simba looks later in the movie when he's an adolescent. And he's sort of like a deer in the headlights. Everything is coming in and nothing is coming out. But when the person integrates their shadow and gets the aggressive part of themselves integrated into their personality, their faces harden. And if you look at people, you can tell because the people who are too agreeable look childlike and innocent and the people who, well, a hyper aggressive person will look, you know, mean and cruel. But I've seen people's face changes, change, face change in the course of therapy. 
uh, men and women. So, and what happens is they start to look more mature, and it's it's more like they're they're judging the world as well as interacting with it properly. Once they integrate that more disagreeable part of them, it's very very necessary, and that's part of the incorporation of the Jung.